I just, um, I fell in love. I, I did learn about strategies and I fell in love with the, the diversity of all the different things you can do. And still to this day, 40 years later, 40, 45 years later, almost, I am a big proponent of options. It's the best investment vehicle because you can um, dial in your risk perfectly, uh, risk reward perfectly. And there's all sorts of different um, opportunities. You could get stuck in a jam with one strategy and add to it and all of a sudden change your thesis, right? Welcome back to the Money Seed Podcast. Today, my guest is Tony Saliba. Tony is the CEO and founder of Liquid Mercury. He's an options trading legend. He's a successful entrepreneur. Tony, welcome to the show. Hey, Gabe, thank you. Great to be here. Tony, it's an absolute honor to have you. Um, you know, one of the books I mention quite frequently on this show is this one here, Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Um, and it's funny because one of the reasons why I like the book and one of the reasons why I keep bringing it up on the show is when I got my MBA, when I went to school for my business degree, you know, one of these genius profs told us that it's impossible to beat the market. The market's efficient. And no matter how, how hard you try in the long run, you can't beat it. Um, and interestingly enough, me being a good student, I generally believed it. And until I came across this book a few years ago, and it completely, you know, blew apart that myth where Jack Schrager goes through example after example of full-time professional traders who beat the market and not just beat the market like a year here, a year there, they do it consistently. And you are featured in that book. So first of all, congratulations, Tony. Thank you. Thank um, you. And you did it using options. So tell me, I mean, a lot of people, especially in that book, back in those days, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of people did it using futures, some using stocks. What was it about options? Well, I mean, I got into options because it was new. And um, I didn't know I was going to be involved in the markets. I, I went to school to be a journalist. <laughs> and um, I switched my majors um, halfway through my freshman year when my um, counselor um, said um, that, you know, you're never going to make any money being a journalist. So I said, well, who makes all the money? And then they said, well, um, uh, business people do, and they need the country needs accountants. So I got into accountancy, and oh my God, was it boring! But then at the end of my college um, career, um, a trustee of the uh, university went to Indiana University. Um, said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "I was interviewing for sales roles and things with different um, like Fortune 500 companies." He said, "Ever think ever think about being a?" stockbroker. So this is 1977 and the Jimmy Carter malaise days where a big day on Wall Street was 10 million shares the whole day, right? And um, I said, okay, um, I'll try this out. And they handed me the options prospectus. And if anybody wants to look up options prospectus, it's a legal document that talks about exercise and assignment and oh my God, nothing about trading, nothing about strategies, nothing about the beauty of options, right? You know, you, you trade options, so you know. And um, I just, um, I fell in love. I, I did learn about strategies and I fell in love with the, the diversity of all the different things you can do. And still to this day, 40 years later, 40, 45 years later almost, I am a big proponent of options. It's the best investment vehicle because you can um, dial in your risk perfectly, uh, risk reward perfectly. And there's all sorts of different um, opportunities. You could get stuck in a jam with one strategy and add to it and all of a sudden change your thesis, right? So um, yeah, I, I jumped in. I became a market maker by happenstance. I was clerking on the floor and a guy I caddied for uh, was down there. He had sold a haberdashery business and was in his probably in his uh, 70s, early 70s, and maybe late 60s. And he was just like chilling. He didn't know what he was doing. And um, he saw me and I caddied, you know, I had caddied for him for years. And he said, You know what you're doing down here? And I said, Yeah. And I showed him. And then after a few months of making him some money in his 
in his uh, personal account, he um, he asked me, he said, can you do that? You know, you want to be, you know, you want to do that professionally? You want to do that, you know, full time? And he got me on the seat. Um, and I, I'm a guy that goes all in, right? And I studied and learned all about different strategies and, and um, kind of mastered early on, long before computers. I did everything on, uh, I have some around here, trading cards, <laughs> all by hand, right? Tutto fatto mano, as my Italian brothers would say. <laughs> and I just, um, I took to it. So it's the best. And anybody who's trading options, I ex always extend a, a hand to say, any way I can help you, um, you know, you can hit us on our website and I'll answer questions for you. Tony, I fell in lo love with options about three years back, and I, I haven't looked back. Um, but one of the things I experienced is what I feel like most people experience when they get into options is you get excited and the market moves really quick when you got options. Like you could be up 20% one day and 30% down the next, even though the actual underlying stock is only moving a few percent each way, et cetera. And it's a lot to kind of manage you know, psychologically. And so a lot of people end up losing a lot of their options trading accounts in the first year. What advice would you give somebody who's kind of fresh into it, in whether it's risk assessment or whether it's managing, sizing? How can people avoid that pitfall in the first year? So sizing is so key. Well, first of all, um, I was saying to someone earlier just today that um, when, when we traded, when I was on the floor, there's your strategy and then there's also money management. And money management is your sizing, you know, what's your clip size? How do you scale in and out of position? I'm a big advocate of scaling. Um, if your first trade is right and it takes off, maybe you're smaller in, in a profitable position than larger in a losing position. So you can scale into it if the thesis goes against you a little bit for a little while. Um, so money management is huge. Um, also, um, I'm a big proponent of doing your homework and understanding if you're trading options. Look, the, you know, these one day, to, um, you know, zero to, uh, to expiration options are huge. They remind you of which popular American city? Las Vegas. So, you know, they're, <laughs> very, they're very much a roll of the dice. And um, OK, you know, they're not for everybody, but, you know, they're not investing. Um, they could help an existing position if you're long and underlying, you're never going to lose, uh, never going to um, sell. Uh, you can overwrite a little bit or whatever, but um, understanding your strategy and um, assessing the proper risk management for your, not only for your capital, but for your disposition, right? So a lot of this is personal, unlike any other vehicle uh equities even futures which matter <clears throat> but with options it's more so because like you said you could be up 20 percent one day down 30 percent the next day it can be emotional um i had somebody on a podcast recently ask me well if somebody came to you for trading advice a newbie you know what like what kind of questions or what uh, discussion would you have with them and i would immediately ask them about their personality, you know, and what is their disposition to um, handling risk. Some people totally freak out and then lose it. Others maybe are too cavalier and positions can go against them. So depending upon your tolerance for risk, both capital and personality, um, you you should do, uh, they call me Mr. What If. You should do your what ifs, right? You should Take a position, you know, um, stretch it out, um, shock it up 15%, uh, shock it down 15%, and uh, both volatility and price, and see if you can live with that. So for newbies, that's definitely a place to start. For those who are intermediates or seasoned vets, um, are your trading tools the right um, systems, right? Are your execution um, um pla is your execution platform giving you the best um, run for your money and things like that. So there's 
other things that are beyond your personal situation with options that can really make a difference. If someone enters a position and it starts to go against them, typically how long do you hold a losing position? Great, great point. So I'm a scaredy cat. You know, I've always um, tried to be risk averse and um, I don't stay in a position too long. Um, I don't have any really cold, hard metrics that um, can be applied across the board, but I typically will not, you know, probably invest more than my entire portfolio in one strategy. And then maybe if I lose um, uh, 50% of that um, risk reward profile in that one strategy, I'll blow it out. But what I've found, and I'm not trading today, I'm really, I'm really running our um, fintech company, but during the lockdown years, as I like to call them, when everybody is, you know, trading the meme stocks, and I, I was standing right here doing a little bit of uh, work on one machine and watching the market out of the corner of my eye on the other machine, and I was trading uh, GameStop and uh, BlackBerry and a few others. Oh my God, I was really letting it fly. Um, you got to do your what ifs, right? And um, I was, I was doing a trade that. You know, I was long, like the 300s. This was in January 21, right? But I was like long the 300s, and I was selling the uh, thousands, and I was doing it on a ratio for a credit. And a lot of the clearing firms were not letting you sell naked after a while, okay? After the very you know beginning of the run up, but um, people were like, well, you know, why would you buy anything? Why wouldn't you just sell the thousands? I'm like, well, okay, because I'm scared and I'm risk averse, and this makes sense. So my break even was like at 1300, and then it dropped off the table. And as we know, you know, GameStop, GameStop never really got over 400. Um, but do your what ifs and get ready to pull the ripcord. <laughs> Or, Good advice. or as I'm starting to say, turn it into a different spread. You can, you know, uh, turn it into a butterfly. So having a, a great spread on it, not, not such a good price is better than maybe just taking the loss right away. That's good advice. And for somebody who's never really dipped their feet into options, what do you think is the easiest way to get started? Like, is it, is it covered calls? Is it, you know, naked puts on stocks you want to buy anyway? What's the best? way to ease well, into it that latter uh, one naked you know naked puts in a stock you want to buy anyways that wasn't really popular in the early days in fact um i early on got involved with the uh exchange cboe's marketing department to, to help you know i felt you know very grateful i wanted to give back so i volunteered to go around with um you know non-trading marketing people and talk to uh, registered reps all around the country who went to a lot of, you know, um, not the big cities, but the maybe second tier cities uh, that tra that traded options. And we couldn't talk about selling naked puts. That was taboo. But then about 20 years ago, it, you know, dawned on everybody, hey, if you want to own that stock anyways, you know, Sell the puts. The worst case scenario, you're going to buy it at a cheaper price. So that, you know, got off, came off the taboo list in terms of the exchange um, staff talking about it a while ago. But uh, I think you know that's that's a easy to understand, great strategy. You might not, you know, make as much as if you're doing another strategy. But as a newbie, yes, that's a great. Um, covered calls are the equivalent of selling those puts, right? I mean, depending upon um, which calls you sell, um, if you own the stock and you sell at the money, it's the equivalence of selling the at the money put naked, right? So um, um, your desire to keep the stock prevents you from worrying about the downside. The covered call gives you extra premium but limits your upside uh, potential. I think. Legging, this is a complex, quote, complex strategy, 
but butterflies. That's been my stock and trade all my life. Um, I, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, you have to get a, a, a tattoo, I would get a tattoo of a uh, Schmetterling, uh, German for, you know, butterfly. Um, because I made a lot of money trading butterflies over the years. And butterflies are so cool because of the four legs, it allows you to not have to be perfect. If you leg into a butterfly, you have four trades to get it right. So for a newbie to say, well, I'm going to buy a vertical call spread because I'm bullish on the stock. And if the stock goes your way and the call spread starts to um, improve, increase in value, you can close it out for your profit or you can sell a call spread on top of that and turn it into a butterfly. But also, if the stock goes against you, you can sell that call spread and you can be in a butterfly, which is a good position, but at a worse price. So you, there's some saving grace in having those four legs to play with. It's a little bit more complex for a, for a brand new person, but it isn't that hard to learn about them. There's a lot of literature, a lot of videos uh, you know, on YouTube to um, help you learn about um, that strategy. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of a lot of people just flat out buying or selling iron condors or flat out buying or selling butterflies. But it sounds like what you're saying is you leg into it. So you start with one spread. And then depending on how it goes, you might open a second spread. Yeah, yeah if you have, a, you know, if you disposition, you're bullish on the stock, you start with, you know, you can even start with buying the call. And if the call starts to fade, if the stock is flat or starts to go against you, you can sell the two middle legs and then wait to buy the upper strike, the outside wing, um, and get in the butterfly. So I use it at, you know, as a defensive mechanism, but also uh, a strategy to leg into. And then, you know, you get into the rhythm of, of the trading day and you can, you know, start with one lots, start to add to it. At the end of the day, maybe you have 10 butterflies on at a great price. Fantastic. Tony, I could talk about options all day. Let's talk about your books. You are an accomplished author. You have several books, including, I think, uh, Managing Expectations. I think you have a book on options uh, spreads, right? Spread strategies. Tell us about your books and where can people find them? Well, I think they're all on Amazon. Um, one or two might be out of print. I wrote my first book in 2000, basically just to answer questions. and. I've had a number of companies over the years, and at the time I had a training a company. I, we trained thousands, almost 10,000 professionals how to trade options. So I wrote the first book as a workbook for uh, new traders, and I think that's still available. We just call it the options workbook. It's got real world um, examples in it and quizzes and a test helps walk through new you know people new to options with a format of being able to understand spread trading in a very you know logical and meaningful uh, way um, I think my most popular book was um, strategies for directionless markets which was all about butterflies and um, in I would say I think we did that one um, after the market bounced after 08, I think I, I think I did that maybe in 2010 or 11 when the market just was going sideways for a while. And, um, you know, volatilities dropped, premium came out of, uh, out of options. So we wrote, um, I worked with a couple of my colleagues when we wrote the book, um, Strategies for Directionless Markets. It's, it's a little bit more than a beginner's book, maybe, you know, almost intermediate. I mean, everybody has their own opinion of where they are in that. And um, I think that one was the most popular one. My most recent one, which has been about um, five or six years now, managing expectations, more intermediate, uh, gets more into theory behind trading. Um, you know, I was a market maker on the floor for 13 years, and then I had a, I had a DPM that my um, brother ran and I, you know, was tangentially involved while I was building my uh, fintech companies. Um, a DPM is designated primary market maker. So 
I wrote this book to talk about different styles of trading and some of the philosophy behind trading. Um, and that one's available definitely on Amazon. If anybody's interested, if they go to our website, um, it's liquidmercury.com. Uh, we're a digital asset um, infrastructure provider, but I'm still in touch with anybody who wants to ask me questions. I get at least one or two every week about market wizards on LinkedIn. Okay, so, um, you know, there's not a lot of us in that first book. There's the, some of us have passed away, <laughs> but um, uh, not a lot of us are still trading or in the markets. But I think you're only as old as the woman you feel. So um, I married a very young woman, and um, I, I figure I'll be doing this for quite a while, okay, to tell you the truth. So, Tony, getting back to the idea that uh, Liquid Mercury, your company, you guys have an exciting digital asset, a digital product. I believe you and I talked about it briefly. It's Merck, M-E-R-C. Tell us more about it, and what, is it, uh, what does it do? Well, the Merck is our token. Um, it's our digital uh, smart contract that is actually tied to um, value based on our customer base. It's a, a discount token that allows users of our products. We're a B2B, so we sell to big institutions. But um, the Merck has a secondary market, an internal market for those who own the Merck that we control that allows the holder of the Merck to sell the discount capabilities to our customers who may not um, have um, bought the Mercs. So there is a, a real value to owning the tokens. Um, as our company grows, as our customer base grows, the demand for those discounts will grow and, and obviously will give a yield, if you will, or a um, discount return to the, the holder. We also have a loyalty program for individuals that we're launching in January that is curated third-party software, mostly options related that I've um, chosen. My staff has collected a bunch of third-party tools um, and make those available. Um, research, very specific um, proprietary research for our Merck holders, and also Anyone who's an individual that's on a platform of ours, and we have other um, companies that white label our software, we give them a discount on a rebate on their trading. So um, all that information is at our website at liquidmercury.com, Gabe. Um, and we, you know, we have a very uh, high-touch business where our staff will personally answer questions. And if people want access to me, I'll answer those questions too. And if somebody wants to be an investor in Merck, uh, what are some of the requirements? Well, we really would prefer somebody to be, um, you know, a seasoned trader. And um, um, you can either find the Mercs on DeFi. If you're an American uh, citizen, you, um, if you're a non-American citizen, we're on uh, CEX. And on the 16th, in a couple days, few days, we launch on BitRu, and then we have um, two more exchanges that are taking us live uh, before the end of January. And one is going to be the first digital asset sanctioned exchange in America called Prometheum. And they've invited us to be in the first tranche of digital assets uh, that they launch. So Americans will be able to buy it freely on an exchange. But if you are trading crypto at all, uh, or digital assets as we would prefer to call them, um, you can go to um, um, Uniswap. Uniswap um, lists us. And uh, if, you, if you look at CoinGecko, you can see, uh, just track our progress. You can see our daily trading volume and our price chart on CoinGecko. That's M-E-R-C. Sounds good. I'll put all these links into the show notes. Uh, Tony, you also have a fantastic track record of being an investor in early stage startups. Tell us, um, in a nutshell, when you are evaluating a company or an idea, what are some of the things you look for that tell you, hey, this is a winner? Well, the number one thing is the management team. 
Okay. To me, the, I mean, the idea has got to be a good idea. The, you know, the thesis needs to hold water and their um, pro forma projections need to make sense. But if the character of the people running the business falls short or is you're questioning it, to me, that's a red flag. So I like to invest in, well, people like myself and those who worked with me over the years that um, their business is a second family. Uh, people um, take their work home to a degree to think about problems or issues uh, in off hours because that's one way to help solve them during the day. I'm not saying you have to be a workaholic, but I want to see a management team that really cares, that is vested, has a vested interest in the success of the product or the solution. And um, that's, you know, I think um, um, I think Stephen Covey wrote a book um, called The Speed of Trust. And we we work at the speed of trust because we work together for so long. And I look for that in other uh, situations where the management team has um, had some history together. I think those are big um, green flags, if you will, to um, go forward with that. Tony, as we move to wrap up this this interview, tell me, where can people reach out to you and learn more about Liquid Mercury and some of the other cool stuff you're doing? Well, we're on all socials under, I think, AJ Market Wizard is my um, Twitter handle, if you will, or X. And then um, I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, under my name. But liquidmercury.com is our website. And we have a, a member's portal for anybody who I think it's a small, you know, minimal amount of Mercs if you stake a few hundred dollars worth of Mercs. There's uh, other rewards, but you get access to this um comms communication portal for members and i answer questions in group mostly about options but some about digital assets and as the digital asset sphere um grows that's going to be more and more relevant but one thing gave about your thesis for this podcast about how to get ahead through earning equity I believe that that's the best way, whether it's equity you produce in, in a startup of your own or invest with a friend who starts it up or finding the right company that's publicly traded, um, equity is going to help you outpace uh, modern um, um, uh, mores and issues with um, your finances because that equity power can uh, help you know give you leverage to um, be more um, successful down the line than just um, your your job and and hopefully your employment offers um, equity options as part of the package which we do with all our companies but that's the best way to, to get ahead and that's why I love the thesis of your podcast yeah thanks very much Tony absolutely and uh I agree 100%. If you have the privilege to work for a company that gives you equity, um, that is a huge upside. Um, and that's, that's all, that should always be a, a huge consideration. And whether someone accepts a job offer or not is, Hey, do I get a, do I get a share of the equity and do I get to participate in the upside? Yeah, so, absolutely. so thanks very much for offering that to the people who work for you, Tony. I think that's fantastic. And thank you very much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure to, to host you, Tony. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Gabe. You too. It was great to, to do this and, and look forward to the next time. Hey, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Money Seed Podcast. Please remember to click like and subscribe. It really helps spread the message to other investors and it helps attract new viewers to the show. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much.